Hello and welcome. This is Mark Silver with Heart of Business, and I wanted to have a conversation with someone that I have known for quite some time, Chris Johnson, who uh, recently came out with a book, The Leadership Pause. And um, so, hello, Chris. <laughs> welcome. Hello. Glad Hi. you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely yeah. to be here. <laughs> it's really good to have you here. And she wrote an entire book about pausing. And this felt really important to talk about, um, to bring to the heart of business audience. And I just want to just kind of briefly, I've got Chris's bio here. Um, she's the founder of Q4 Consulting. And, um, you know, what she's written here, what's been written about her is she partners with individuals and organizations to, to design and implement training programs that access intuition, surface internalized patterns and mindsets, and address the roadblocks inherent in change. And she's been doing this work for quite some time, quite some time. We had met um, 10 years ago, easily. Mm -hmm. And um, and this idea of the pause was central to her even then, because we had talked about it at that point. Mm -hmm. And the reason why it's so important, because you know, this book, The Leadership Pause, I know that for a lot of heart of business folks, leadership is not a top topic. You know, when you're either self-employed, or you have a tiny business now, often thinking about leadership. But as I've come to understand over the years, leadership is actually really critical. It's connected to sovereignty. It's connected to how we move in the world. And this idea of pausing, Anyway, Chris has a lot. I, Chris has a lot to say about it, so I'm not going to go off on my rant about it. But I just, I think, did, I, I, here's the, here's the question I want to start with, Chris. Is that did it take, like, what kind? Did it take courage, like, to to like to go out there and say, I want to write an entire book about mm -hmm. pausing. I mean. I can't imagine that was an easy pitch to a publisher. I'm just, I'm curious, <laughs> I'm curious, you know, what, you know, the, the, the kind of like what it's been like as a journey to champion the importance of the pause. Yeah, there's a lot there. Uh, so what I would say is uh, kind of historically when I was a kid loving words, I always thought that I'd write a book. And then it was one of those things that you kind of put aside and don't attend to for a really long time. And in my own practice of mindfulness, my own kind of spiritual path, it became increasingly important to me personally to pause. And so when we met just over 10 years or so ago, actually you, um, you really helped me at the time to get some clarity around I was at a crossroads around why I needed to pause. And then in the ensuing conversation, it was like, well, actually all of us who are leading a business, it doesn't matter if it's a big corporation or you're a solopreneur, we're all leaders in the sense that we want to bring something about that matters to us. And we want to affect the change that'll open the path for that to unfold. So did it take a lot of courage? Yeah, I was on the edge of it and like, oh, can I allow myself to be that vulnerable, that visible? Um, what difference does it make? My gremlins came out a number of times and we're talking like, you don't have anything to say. But the reality is, I really believe that the pausing, the practice of remembrance, the capacity to be here now on purpose, we know it's a good idea from a spiritual, a psychological point of view, what I talk about in the book uh, a little bit more and I unpack is some of the biology about it. If we can't pause and stop, all the chemicals that have us racing around trying to do effective jobs in our business and make change, all of those are amped up. And especially today, and especially since COVID, everything's a little more amped up than it normally is and it clouds our thinking. So all the really good work that we have great intentions to do Mm. It has a harder time unfolding. Yeah. So I really think that this pause practice is, um, is where it's at. It's a great starting point. And you were a big part of 
helping me get clarity around that for myself and for the people that I've subsequently worked with. Mm, that's beautiful. I'm grateful I could be, you know, a support to you around that. And mm-hmm. I'm so grateful you were carrying it. And so I think there's a, I think there's an interesting thing to look at, which is, you know, you, you obviously, I mean, you wrote a whole book about pause. Uh-huh. What, what do you mean by pause? I, you know, if you can explain a bit, because you talked about the biology of a pause, I, I, mm-hmm. I imagine, you know, it's not exactly the same as just any time you stop. Like there's a, there's, there's no. more to it than that. And I, I think yeah. that, that would be important yeah. to unpack a little bit if you're willing. I am. So it's, uh, the pause is very like breathing, right? So we have the capacity as humans where we can be unaware of our, the fact that we're breathing. Like right now we're talking and we're probably not aware of our breathing. And, um, and then we can be very aware of and intentional about how we're working with our breath. The same is true of pause. We have natural kinds of pauses in our day, but we can all, that are unconscious and invisible to us. And then there are these pauses that we can choose to have. So the way that I write about the pause in the setup of the book, I talk about, and the first chapter is really about the perpetual white water that we're all living in. And it's, it's very unsettling in many ways, opportunities, but a lot of unsettling. And then in the second chapter, I actually answer your question around what is a pause. And really the pause is an intentional interruption of an automatic way of reacting. And so you don't actually have to, stop like a hard stop it could just be a low it's bringing ourselves to an awareness of what's happening right in the moment without jumping to the next conclusion or getting caught up in busyness and activity and um i say that it's actually the the flywheel for us to be increasingly effective in the life and the work that we do Mm. why do you say that what's the I think that mindfulness, yeah, Yeah. mindfulness is a force multiplier. So when we practice being mindfully, intentionally aware, and that's a lifelong process, it's not like we arrive, but it's an ongoing kind of deal, right? (laughs) Um, That's, it's a force multiplier, you can take that anywhere you go all the time. By pausing, you know, flywheel gets some momentum going, and then we really get going and lots of new juice and energy gets aroused. So the flywheel is really, I think that's what the pause is. Actually, there's a guy, some of you and some others of your listeners might know this gentleman, Kevin Cashman. He's a leadership guy himself. He works at Corn Ferry. They do a lot of leadership work. And um, there was a few years back, there was a quote that he, I came across that he wrote and I hung on to it because I was kind of at one of those messy spots and moments And he asked the question, which I do talk about in the book. He's like, you know, I'll botch this just a little. He said something like, um, why would a hard charging, achievement oriented leader decide to pause? Like, why would they do that? And his answer then in another sentence or so was because pause is what allows us to work with the levels of complexity that we're faced with today. That pause helps us sort that out. And I would say that it helps us sort it out, not just kind of mentally or psychologically or even emotionally, but really all the way down to the biology. It helps us have a clean path. Mm. So that's why I say that. Yeah. Yeah, That makes sense. Awesome. It does make sense. Um, I'm, you know, one of the, one of the things that we talk about, because a lot of what you talk about is familiar to me through our practice of the remembrance Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think it's always an interesting place of like, how does one start to pause? And I don't just mean in the moment. I mean, so like it's an awareness practice and mm-hmm. you're talking about an intentional interruption of unconsciousness. But yes. if you're unconscious, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, it's like how, you know, what are what are some ways that you encourage people to help to um, 
break, you know, it's like, how do you wake up? Because if you're unconscious, you're unconscious, you know, and yeah. it's like, there's, 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 it's hard to bring intentionality into unconsciousness. So I'm, I'm curious, because I, I feel like that's a, such a starting point for our clients as well. Um, and mm -hmm. I know for me and my, um, you know, my journey on the spiritual path, it's like, mm -hmm. once you've gotten going, you know, the pathways get much, much easier. And it's become mm -hmm. easy for me, you know, relatively, mm -hmm. <laughs> depending yeah. on how badly I'm activated. So I'm, yeah. but I'm curious <laughs> about, I'm curious about that. Yeah, that's like, okay, hard charging or overwhelmed or, you know, um, uh, you know, solopreneur, or small business owner, heart charging probably isn't our audience so much, but still it's like the, ah, I got so much to do. And like, anyway, you get the question without me going on and mm -hmm. on and on about it. Mm -hmm. Actually, I think that you, the answer is akin to what you just said about depends on how activated I am. <laughs> um, so at one point in the book, I talk about the beauty of triggers and the triggers are actually the doorway. And I would say that's a great place to start. So a trigger is any time or anything or anybody or any bit of whatever it is that causes us to react and um, to just react instead of respond. And so we're caught up in stuff, we're overwhelmed, et cetera. So in terms of somebody being unconscious, there's not a human on the planet that I've ever talked to who doesn't say, oh yeah, I get all triggered. And they may use different language about it, but it's like, oh, they got activated, I got triggered. I'm like all bent out of shape or whatever. Those moments are gold because what happens is if I can help folks to slow down, like, well, what is that? And how does it sound? And what does it feel like? And where do you notice it in your body? Then people start to be like, then they get curious. And now they're slowing down and they're starting to actually pause um, with a directed kind of attention because I'm helping them do that. And then it's like, well, is that thing that you're doing in reactivity, is it working? And most people are like, no, it really doesn't work so well or whatever, you know? And right. then it's like, well, so if you could like shift that just a little bit, what would be the benefit to you of shifting that? And then they'll tell me what they think. It's like, okay, well, you could probably have more of that if you were able to bring a pause, kind of an intentional interruption of that thing so that you could get curious and learn from it, from the very experience you already have, right? Right. How's that sound? Well, it's, well, it's interesting. It leads me to other questions, but I want to, just in understanding what you said, it mm -hmm. sounds like you kind of have to start by unpacking it after the fact it's not something that you're often going to be able to just introduce into the moment. And by unpacking it after the fact, you recognize the activities that start, you know, that, that cause you not to pause. Is it that you then help people say, oh, it's this activity where you get activated, triggered, bent out of shape, so that you know the next time you approach that, Mm -hmm. to have that much more awareness that you're probably going to get activated again. Is that what you're saying or is it, uh, is there something different? Well, there, that is what I'm saying, except I wouldn't say it's after the fact necessarily. What I would say and, and how I started is triggers are a way in. So most people that I meet um, and work with would like to have more effectiveness in their life if they're in business or in a leadership role, they'd like to be more effective with themselves and their team. They'd like to have, most people say they'd like to have a little bit more time and a little bit more energy. All of those things are very common to the people that I'm working with. True. So, so how do you, so a question to them would be, so what stopped you from already having that, that, that you would like, and they'll give me a variety of reasons. It's like, well, I wonder what would happen if you just reflected on that a little bit or pondered it or using their language to address how they've spoken about it. And then, um, but I don't know how to do that, Chris, or I can't stay there very long or I'm distracted all the time. And so in some ways, I guess you're right. It would be unpacking it later, but it's really marrying with their initial concern and what they say they want. 
Mm-hmm. And almost always people want something much deeper than that. Mm-hmm. And yet that's the, the entry point. Yeah. Well, I think what you're saying is quite profound because you're, what you're saying is that, if I'm understanding this correctly, is that when someone is activated, it's not just the moment that they're activated in, you know, like, you know, like they're in front of their team or they're, you know, Mm -hmm. in front of their business or they're facing something that's just like, ah, but that Mm -hmm. overwhelm that rises up and creates unconsciousness continues long after that moment and they carry Mm -hmm. it with them. So when you're unpacking it, you're not even, it may not be in the moment where it was initiated, but it's happening it's the reality of it is still very present, even if you're having the conversation, you know, an hour or a day or a week after the catalyzing moment. Is that, did I understand yeah, I would, that correctly? Yeah, I would say that's right. And the flip side is also true that the shaping of who we are in life over time that got us to this moment in time, mm-hmm. that shaping served us really well kept us safe, connected to our people, um, our tribe, and hopefully has had a sense of dignity. Like I have a a place here on the planet and something to offer. So, but all of that shaping um, is usually unconscious and out of our awareness. And some of it was designed and uh, set up as a way to just deal with the stresses of life. Some of it traumatic for some of us. Um, And so that's usually invisible. We usually don't know that that's happening. And that's part of the beauty of our biology is that we're very adaptable. And it's often though these patterns that we run up against that um, that need to shift in order for us to kind of go to the next level or go deeper in our practice or whatnot. So it's kind of before, and then yes, it leads long after. So we're very, we're much more sensitive creatures mm-hmm. than we uh, like, like to admit to ourselves. I and, think it's very true. Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, and I really like that because one of the things that I want to, like, it brings a great sense of hopefulness because I think that Mm -hmm. part of the culture, this toxic culture that we're in that doesn't allow us to pause and didn't teach us to pause or remember um, in the first place that Mm -hmm. even makes the work that you and I do necessary in the first place. But it's like the, like it seems almost like an impossible task to try to catch it on the bounce when mm-hmm. you're already kind of overwhelmed and caught in the white water. And so the hopefulness here mm-hmm. is that this is actually a reality that we carry with us that has reverberations whenever we do the work, like the pause really mm-hmm. untangles things in a yes. very profound way. And, um, and I think that I mean, this is something that, um, yeah, just it's, it's, you know, we talk about it in terms of being able to be aware of love's presence in any moment mm-hmm. and in any circumstance and how hard it is to spot if we're not mm-hmm. witnessing, like if we're not in a play, like the Sufis talk about the witnessing mm-hmm. of the reality and yeah. I feel like what you're doing with this work is like opening a portal to stepping into reality out of this, um, out of the world of illusion that Mm -hmm. says that whatever you're doing is an emergency and you have to do it right now. And, you know, Mm -hmm. or you're doomed. Yes. Um, Yes. And to your point. um, So if I had to say my purpose, my purpose is about embodying love to heal in in the work that I do. So that's really kind of it in a nutshell. And when I think about, and how I set up the book is, there's a lot of wicked problems that are facing us as people Mm -hmm. in the planet. And we need to have everyone who's called in their heart And I'm going to call all of those, I'm going to name all those people as leaders, regardless of what um, formal role they have uh, or not have, because they're called to contribute to the healing. And so in order for us to be clean vessels for that, uh, we do want to be able to 
cultivate the pause to be present much more and then we'll have we'll be able to access the resources that are inherent the wisdom that's there for the right kind of decision making and the next right action to take and the community conversation to be listening into all of that is really predicated i would say on the pause now that does not mean that the pause is squishy and soft and all of that although it can be it can be really tough uh, you know susan scott is an author you may know Fierce Conversations. She wrote this book years ago. And there's one of her lines I use all the time. Let the silence do the heavy lifting. And when we let the silence do the heavy lifting, that's, that's hard. That's an intensive kick-ass kind of pause, I think. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, I agree hundred percent. I was just writing about, um, how love gets talked about in this culture is nice or comforting or warm. And, but, you know, from a Sufi point of view, love is annihilating and that's, yes. mm-hmm. and there are things that need to be annihilated. And yes. um, so I love it. Um, yeah. How, um, how do you, like, what does it look like in your own day incorporating the pause into your work? I'm curious how that, how you mm-hmm. carry that as a personal practice. Yeah. Well, so I have a morning meditation practice that's usually anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I have a Zen teacher that I work with. Um, and so always the conversations that we have, they're not daily, of course, but they're part of my journal writing when I'm writing. Um, probably the biggest thing that I, two, two big things that help me every day. One is a relational peace with my husband so that we have a a little ritual that started it's a a morning pause practice together that we did not set out to say hey i think we should do this it wasn't like that it it grew organically but it's really a way to connect with each other with the pause and wish each other well during the day so that's important in terms of starting our days off well and then when i go to work um the first few minutes at work are really about getting grounded. So I'll like touch my door handle in the desk with some intention and like I'll do an uplift centering is what I call it. It's kind of a standing pause practice and it's really just to get aligned. And then I might have to do that a gazillion times a day, depending on the day, but um, you know how, how it goes, but, um, but it's very much top of mind. I would say that very, mm-hmm. very top of mind. And um but part of uh, before you and I, before you hit the cord, I was mentioning to you that this, uh, this book, this was an arduous process. And part of the process was that it was much more self-confrontational to write this book than mm. I had set out. So like, you know, I'm trained, <laughs> like, you know, right. it's like, oh, I got an outline. We're going to go and I'm going to talk, you know, some of that happened, but the book ended up having quite the life of its own. And the confrontation part was, consistently like you teach this are you practicing it how are you right. practicing it if somebody asked you like did a spot check today kind of like they're doing with me now um how are you living it yeah. you know would i have an answer that i could congruently in alignment and integrity speak to you and um so it's like okay you better better make darn good and sure that that this is stuff that you're committed to practicing and living so it was good. It was hard it, and it was good. It was very satisfying, but yeah. not, not cause it was easy cause it wasn't. No, a lot of mm-hmm. things that are satisfying are not easy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate mm-hmm. you sharing that. Yeah. Thanks for asking. It is hard to um, challenging mm-hmm. to be consistent in one's practice, you know, do you, um, do you use any kind of, uh, I mean, you mentioned your practice in the morning and your practice with your husband, which I, I love both mm-hmm. of those things. Um, mm-hmm. Do you use any kind of um, external structure to help interrupt your day to bring your awareness back? I'm curious if there's- I'm not sure it, if there's something in particular you're referencing. Um, is there- well, I'm just, well, so when I, I'm, I'm, I'm off the script at the moment. So like, 
as a as a, as a Sufi Muslim, you know, mm -hmm. we're supposed to pray five times a day on a good day, I uh -huh. pray. Yeah. Um, and, um, and if I were living in a Muslim country, there would be a call to prayer that would interrupt, which is supposed right. to do exactly what you're describing. Right. There's an app for that. I have a prayer app on my phone that does the call <laughs> to prayer uh -huh. at the particular times. <laughs> and, um, and I know how much I depend on that interruption. And I'm just curious if there's, you know, if that's, and uh, I'm, I'm just always curious because there's like the different spiritual paths I know have, mm -hmm. um, have a, often have a structure or schedule mm -hmm. to the practice routine that is meant to be in loving tension with the demands of the world. And I'm just, I'm just curious how that, how it, it works that up in your, yeah. No, that's a great question. So, so we sit zazen twice a day at seven uh, in the morning at seven in the evening. I don't usually make the seven in the evening. So I'll make the seven in the morning time, whether I actually sit with the community or I'm sitting on my own. Um, when I go to eat lunch, and sometimes lunch is a little tricky during the course of a full day, but it's um, turning off the computer, putting my phone down and like offering moments of quiet and pause and thanks for mm -hmm. the fact that I'm eating. So that's often short, but I do that as a practice. We do the same uh, at dinner. So those, those are kind of structured. I didn't even think about them because there's so much a part of like, we just do them. Um, right. And I also have an app on my phone. So I'm, uh, I have a number of my meditations on the mindfulness app mm -hmm. and that app, um, started with some folks out of Sweden who are learned to teach in the same way, mindfulness-based stress reduction. It has gone beyond that. Um, but I use that app as a way to kind of track myself. So sometimes I'll, often I'll sit with that if I'm not in the community Zazen, I'll use that as a way to help me. And I like it because you can listen to a mindfulness, uh, a record, somebody recording uh, a particular practice. I actually like to sit with just chimes because it helps me kind of go and then come back. Mm -hmm. right. come back. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. I really mm -hmm. appreciate you being willing to share like that. Yeah. As we come close to wrapping up, I'm wondering, can you tell um, an inspiring story of someone who learned to pause and what happened for them by embracing this practice? Yeah, uh, the first guy that comes to mind, uh, his name is also Mark. Um, he was a CEO that I worked with a few years ago. And he's one of these guys who said, you know that phrase, ready, aim, fire. And you know how, I forget who it was, turned it around, ready, fire, aim kind of thing. He said, that's me. I'm always out ahead of everybody. And in fact, he always was really smart guy, really committed in his work. Uh, he worked uh, his stories in the book, actually, he um, runs an adoption agency uh, and they do amazing work. And he's like, when he, I first tried to support him with the pause, he's like, I just can't do this. I can't sit still. I don't know. what. So then we unpacked his situation, kind of like I just described earlier. And then pretty soon, and I would actually work with him in segments. Like, let's just do this between now and the next time we talk. So I don't have to think about, oh my God, I have to do this for the rest of my life. Let's just see what happens. And let's have an attitude of curiosity about what you might discover, what you might learn. And I'm up for being totally wrong. If in fact you discover nothing, you can say, Chris, I've discovered nothing. Well, of course he discovered lots of things where his mind would go, how certain emotions got him triggered, et cetera. And um, before long, he was very much like, Chris, I have to do this now. You know that, right? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I have, I mean, I'm noticing if I don't do this, that I'm less present with the people that I'm serving. I'm not working with my leadership team as effectively. We have big fundraising to go on. So Mark himself became quite the champion and ended up taking it as a practice into their team. So one way we talk about it is about recalibrating. And so we're recalibrating our energy, our presence. That seemed to be a word that resonated not just with him, but with his team. Mm -hmm. and, um, 
And at one point, his teenage daughter had had a, was learning to drive and had had a little bit of a fender bender that freaked her out. And he's like, you know what? I was calm. It's a cucumber. I handled it. It was fine. I didn't get out ahead of myself. You would have been pleased. I'm like, yeah, I'm really pleased for you because it gives you a lot more access to resources you already have and that you can then use. So that's a success story for sure. I love it. I love it. I think it's, I think a lot of us intuitively know, but argue with ourselves and resist that how much (laughs) more efficient and powerful it is to slow down um, and to pause in this kind of intentional matter. Where can people find you? People can find me. Thanks for having me, first of all. But people can find me at uh, q4-consulting.com. That's the website. And if you look on the website, you'll see the book. And you could look and read about the book. You can see what some other people have said about the book. Um, You can click buttons to go buy the book. Or you go on Amazon and look for the leadership pause there. I also have it in um, an ebook and an audible. And the reason I did the audible right away was because many folks are like, I don't have time. I don't have time to read, but I listen to lots of books. So it's like, okay, well, all right, we'll give it to you. So that's it. It's an audible form too, which I've heard from many people say, I just really love this. So that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. Any, any last piece you want to add before we wrap up? Mm -hmm. I would say that you won't know the power of the pause until you put it into practice. And for those in your audience, I know, because I've experienced the remembrance practice myself and do it myself, um, there's more. So don't hesitate to go for more. It's worth it. (sighs) I mean, I'm so delighted, Chris. Thank you so much for showing up here with me and for bringing this into the world. And um, I just send blessings upon your work and upon you. And, uh, you know, may you be lifted up and carried in in amazing ways. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. All right. Peace. Bye.